friends, welcome again to Unlocking Revelation Prophecy Seminar. I've got some incredibly good news for you. Jesus loves you. Isn't that good to hear? Isn't it good to know that Jesus loves you? I, I, you can call me and tell me that every day because I need to hear it. I need to be reminded of that. Um, I got some more good news. You know, uh, probably the biggest enemy that we have is death. Death is something that we just can't see past. It's something that's foreign to us. It's like a, uh, it's like a, uh, when we lose a loved one, it's like a limb being torn away from our body. I just thank God for Calvary. I thank God for Calvary and, and that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, has went before us. You know, a good shepherd goes before us. He's went before us and he's already experienced death. But praise God, praise God, we've got victory. He even even over death. I want to show you a scripture here in Romans chapter 8 and, and picking up verse 37. I think Paul liked to get on top of the, the roof and just shout this out here. Uh, Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things come nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise God. Amen. We've got a God that cares about us, and we've got a God that loves us. Tonight, we're going to be talking about that tough subject. What happens? What happens to you when you die? I mean, what does that? This question has puzzled people throughout the ages. It's always been, been a, a question because we can't see past death here. There's all kind of theories. Now, there's people who are going to tell you that oh, when, you, when, uh, when you die, you always go to heaven. Then there's others tell you, well, when you die, you go to, you, 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 you go to hell or purgatory. And, and then others say, well, when you die, you sleep in the grave. And then there's even some that talks reincarnation. When you die, you're reincarnated into something else. So, but friends, all this theories and everything, that won't help us any. Because everybody's got an opinion. Our faith cannot be built on what he said and she said. Our faith has got to be built on the Word of God. Amen. Friends, the only hope that we have that there's going to be a life beyond the one we're living right now is found on the Word of God. So tonight, once again, we're going to go back to the truth. We're going to go back to the truth. We want to know what Jesus says. Amen? We want to know what Jesus says about this because he's got the final word. Yes. Join me in prayer, please. Father in heaven, once again, we're here seeking truth. Lord, what happens to you? What happens to us when we die? What happens to us? Please, through your word, please reveal this truth to us. We pray for the Holy Spirit. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yes, Jesus is the one that's got the answer. I'm going to begin in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18. Jesus is talking here. He said, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Amen. And I had the keys of Hades and death. Well, see, when we know Jesus, friends, when you know Jesus as Lord and Savior, you don't have to fear death. Now, that's a praise the Lord. Praise God. You don't have to do that. But, you know, I, I don't think it should be a surprise to us because we found out that this enemy, the devil, is trying to do everything he can to try to deceive us. And he has done a very good job seeking to deceive people on this very subject that we're talking about tonight. So what I want to do is we're going to go back to the very beginning. Very beginning, and you'll recognize this scene in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 3, and watch here how the, the devil works, his deceiving power. Very important to watch how he works here. This is what he does. Now the serpent was more subtle than, than, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, now watch this, Yea, as God said, you shall not, that you shall not eat of every tree in the garden. Now, that was his first, that was the first clue right there. Anytime a snake starts talking to you, you better take off running. <laughs> anyway, 
Uh, but let's go on seriously with the, with the uh, in verse verse two here. And the woman said unto the serpent, said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You should not eat of it, neither shall you touch it. Why? Lest you die. And at least you die. At least you die. Right here, right here, friends. Genesis chapter three verse four uh, came the very. That came the first recorded lie in the Bible. The very first lie recorded in the Bible. Now, right there, right here, who did, who did she believe? Who, who, did you, who, who did she believe here? Did she believe the words of Satan? Or did she believe the words of God? Friends, what she did is right here. And this is how the devil works. And this is reading it's so important. Right now, the time that we live in to make sure everything lines up with the Word of God. Friends, she had a choice. But she believed a lie from Satan above the Word of God, did she? Do you see that? See how clear? And we've got to watch how the world does that too because the Satan is, is deceiving. He's the prince of this world. And, he, and we've already learned that he's deceiving the whole world. So that's the reason it's so important to lay everything up beside the Word of God. Especially when it comes to matters of faith. Especially when it has eternal consequences. And so, tonight, we are going to be faced with, with the very same question. Who do you believe? Do you believe uh, uh, what you've always been told out there in the world, or tradition? Or, or, or are you going to believe the Word of God? The Word of God. Again, remember, we are no match for his, uh, Satan's deceiving power. Now, every... Every one of God's beautiful truths. Now, this is a hallmark of, of, of Satan here. He, he, he likes to counterfeit. Every good thing that God does, Satan has counterfeit. He's a, he is a counterfeit. He said, you shall not surely die. You shall not surely die. That's what he said. But you know what, friends? He was a liar. Jesus says in John 8, 44, that he's the father of all lies. The father of all lies. What we need is truth, rock solid truth. So let's go to the Word of God, and we're going to go back even further in the beginning, Genesis chapter two, Genesis chapter two, and and uh, in in verse seven. Now listen to these words right here. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And what happened? Man became a living and man became a living soul. So what we have here is two elements, right? We got clay, a clay body, dirt, and then we got the breath of God. The breath of God. You know, through the union of these two right here, the Bible says man became a living soul. Now, it's very important to note here that man was not given a soul as something separate from the body, but he became a soul through the union of the body and God's breath. Now, I'm going to spend a little time here. I want to illustrate this. and uh, You cannot see this if you're on Facebook. You can if you're on YouTube because uh, we're editing these and we're putting them all on YouTube. But I got a I got I got a chalkboard up on the screen here, and so this chalkboard. Let's look at this. So body, the scripture we just read, body plus breath, body plus the breath or the spirit of the Lord equals what? Soul. A living soul. It's really it's really that simple. There. That's addition. Okay. Now let's do a little subtraction here. Uh, Let's do a little subtraction. Psalms 104, verse 29. Psalms 104, verse 29. It's, we're going to see the very same procedure, but in, in, in reverse here. Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath. They take, take us away their breath, and what happens? They die. they die, and they return to their dust. Okay? Are, are you seeing that then? Seeing that? Okay. So, soul minus the body or bread equals death, right? Very, very simple. You take it, take away the bread, and it equals death here. Now, 
from another scripture, Psalm, the very next scripture, Psalms 104, verse 30. Let us read this carefully. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest their face on the earth. So you send forth the spirit of breath, this very same word, and they are created. Now it's important to know, very important to know to understand this, that if you go back to the original language here, you see the word spirit and the word breath are the very same word. It's called, it's ruach. Ruach is, 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 the, is the original word here. Uh, but it's the breath, it's the wind, it's the spirit of God. It's the living, breathing spirit of God is what it is. What it is. Now we'll talk a little bit more about that here later. But that's very important to understand in this. So now you often hear people say that when a man dies, his soul, his soul goes to heaven or hell. So, so what they're saying here is they're saying that a soul lives forever, is what they're saying. Now, now uh, this might shock you here. There are over 1,700 references in, uh, to the word soul in the Bible. And not even, and, and not even once um, it is mentioned as immortal or undying. Out of 1,700 times, not one time, uh, is it does is it is it mentioned that it's immortal and Im, immortal? Now that should shock you, given especially how widely uh, accepted this belief is now. That when a when a soul dies, it either goes to heaven or hell. It it doesn't uh, because the Bible does not say that. There's only one text in the Bible that even uses the word immortal. On, only one. And let's look at it. First Timothy. Chapter 1 and verse 17. Now to the king, eternal, immortal. Who do you think we're talking about there? God. We're talking about King Jesus. Okay? Invisible. The only wise God. Be honor and glory forever. Amen. Okay? Now, the Bible does use the word uh, immortality. The Bible does use that. And let's see. And here it is in verse Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15 and listen to this closely. Which, he, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings and the lord of lords. Who are we talking about? We're talking about God, Jesus, who only had immortality. So who, who only has immortality? God. Only God has immortality. Is immortal. Period. So, given that, what then is a soul? What what is a soul? Remember, remember in Genesis chapter two verse seven that we read a little while, a little while ago. The body and the breath together. The body and the breath, the ruach, the spirit of God. The body and the the living, life giving breath, spirit of God. Uh, equals a living soul. That's what the definition is. You are a soul. A soul is not a little person inside of you upon when you die, it goes flying away, in other words. It's, it, it's, it's a combination, a body, and, and the breath of God. Now, the Bible teaches us this. Now, I want you to notice this in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. Is the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall do what? It shall die. It doesn't say that it's going to fly away. It doesn't say it's going to fly off. It doesn't say uh, that it's going to fly down to hell. It says that it's going to die. That, that, that die. Okay. So a soul is a living, living breathing body. Uh, a living, breathing. It's not something that's separated uh, from the body, in other words. That's the easiest way that I, I could say it here. Now, listen to these verses right here. Acts chapter 2 and verse four, 41. Then they gladly received the, his word, were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, see, you're, these, are, these are living, breathing bodies here, is, is what we're looking at here. Acts 27, 37. And 
and we were in all the ships 200 three score and 16 souls okay here's here's another one, revelation 16 verse 3 it said and we're going to find here that man is not the only thing uh that that is a soul okay notice here and and the second angel poured out his vow upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. That means all, even, the, even the living creatures that, that are in, even in the ocean are called a living soul. Living soul. So all souls in the sea died. That was very clear. So, what happens? What happens when a man dies? What happens when a man dies? Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and, and verse 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. We're going to learn a whole lot from this scripture right here. Then, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. And the spirit, what does the word spirit mean here? Ruach, breath. breath of God, shall return unto God who gave it. All right? Now, let me show you something here. That <coughs> word ruach, uh, ruach, uh, is, is used 377 times in the Bible. Uh, 117 of these is it's it just that ruach means wind or air. That uh, 33 times is the breath, like the breath of God. 227 times they use the word spirit for ruach, but they all mean the very same thing. Basically, it, it, it's the living, breathing breath of God. Now, it means it means breath. That and that's why it returns to God who gave it. Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna let Scripture explain this. Okay, uh, if 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 the Spirit, I'm gonna go back to this Scripture that we were just said here, Ecclesiastes chapter twelve and verse seven. Now, think about this: if the Spirit is the very essence of a man meaning his thoughts, his feelings, uh, his personality, then this verse says that you existed before you were born. All right, think about this. Then the dust, then the dust re will return to the earth as it was. And what happens? And the spirit will what? Return. So if the spirit were the essence and personality of the person, that means you existed before you were born. Are you seeing what I'm saying here in this scripture here? Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, the verse says the spirit returns to God. Something can't return somewhere that has never been. Right? Because we've never been. Before we were born, that's when we were born. We didn't exist before we were born. We didn't, we didn't exist before we were born. Okay, no. So this, this verse is simply talking about the breath of life. The very breath of life. Now, listen to Job on this. Listen to what Job says. Job chapter 27 and verse 3. All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is where? In my nostrils. In my nostrils. That's right. It's the breath. Very clear, the breath of God. Now, so, and remember, Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, what did God put in man's nostrils? The breath of life. The breath of life. Right? He took the clay, the dust, the dirt, and, and, and breathed in the breath of life into his nostrils. Now, with that in mind, let's go to Luke chapter 23 and verse 46. We want to take a look at Jesus on, on the cross. Jesus on the cross. When, and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said unto it, and he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Now what's he talking about here? I commend the breath of God, the breath of life. I give the breath of life back to you, is what he's saying. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. Now, I'm going to let Scripture prove this once again. Jesus is saying here, into thy hands I commend my spirit, and then Jesus died. Now follow me on this, because this is really important. If the Spirit is the person, the essence, the thoughts, and the feelings of Jesus, then Jesus returned to heaven right then, right? Okay, if, yeah. if, yeah. but, but if that is your way of thinking, there's a problem. 
there's a problem. Because we know that three days later, that Jesus still had not ascended to his Father. Right? We know that. We've already read that scripture in a previous night here. Uh, we, we did. Any time, and, uh, let's go to John chapter 20 and verse 17. Here we go here. Jesus, Jesus said to her, said to her, Mary, he said to her, touch me not. What's he say here? Why? Why? Because he had already, remember, he, he had died and he rested in the tomb, right? And on the third day, he arose. And then here he is talking to Mary. And what did he tell Mary? What did Jesus tell her? Jesus is, Jesus can never lie. What did Jesus tell her? I have not yet ascended. I have not yet ascended to my father is, is what he what he says here and then and then he goes on to say uh, in a future tense he said but I will I ascend to my father and your father and to my God that's future tense here so if the spirit returned to God when he died how could that be right so friends the spirit is simply the breath of life the breath of life is what it is okay all right, now, very, very, very simple. Now, when a man dies, his breath or spirit returns back to God, the breath of life, and the body returns to dust. That's what we've read over and over so far. The very same thing happens to animals. Do you know that? The Bible clearly teaches Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 19. Read it with me. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth the beast. Even one thing befalleth them. As the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they all have one breath. What's that breath? The breath of life that comes from God. So that a man has no preeminence above a beast. For all is vanity. All go into one place. All are of the dust. And all return to dust again. Very clear. All right. So, another good question. Good question. What happens in the grave? I mean, where are the dead? Are they are they in in uh, in the, are they in heaven? Are they in hell? Let's see what the Bible says. Let's go to Acts uh, chapter two and verse twenty nine. This is a good uh, teaching scripture right here. Acts chapter two, verse twenty nine. Men and brethren. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. Now, we know David, don't we? David is a man after God's own heart. Right? King David. Uh, that he is both dead and buried. All right? This is Peter talking. And, and his, his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Now, he's, he's talking to the people, right, that love King David. They still talked about King David. And then, he, and, then, and then he says something. He lets them know that David is still in the grave. He's letting us know that David is still in the grave. Verse 34 here. For David is, what, for David, what's it say here? The first sentence, that's what we're looking at. David is not ascended. David is not ascended into the heavens. Very, very, very clearly there. Friends, David, even David, King David is not in heaven. Now, Let's see what Jesus says here, uh, because this is going to be a very, very important key to helping you understand uh, what happens to you when you die. Now, we all know the story in John chapter 11 of Lazarus. Lazarus. Uh, the Bible tells us here in this story of an experience when Jesus, one of his closest friends, Lazarus, died. And, and, the, uh, and or he was, basically was sick when he first heard about it. And, and the word reached uh, Jesus, that Lazarus was sick, and Jesus just kind of seemingly ignored him, is, is what we, we see happening in the Bible there. And then after a few days, Jesus headed to Bethany, and by this time, Lazarus had already died. Okay, now Jesus is explaining here in the scripture we're going to look at, John chapter 11, uh, and picking up at 11 through 14, he's going to explain to his disciples here uh, the key to understanding about death. These things, these things said he, after that he had said unto them, Our friend Lazarus does what? He sleepeth. All right? But I go that I may awaken him out of his sleep. Then his disciples, Lord, if he sleeps, 
He will do well. Don't miss this part. How be it? Jesus spoke of what? Yeah. His death. He was yeah. dead. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of a rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. That's a good text right there. Yeah, that is a really good text right there. It really is. And you know, why did Jesus wait so long? I mean, uh, why did he wait so long? Because he wanted you and I, and he wanted them to know that he had power even over death, friends. Amen. Praise God for the good news we've got right there. Amen. Very clearly, Jesus is letting them and us know today that Jesus has power even over death. Now, you know, everything's recorded in the Bible. If, did Lazarus say anything about heaven when he woke up? He didn't say anything, did he? If he did, he'd be complaining. What are you bringing me here? No, he didn't say anything. You know why? Because Lazarus was asleep. He was asleep. That's why. Now, death is referred to as sleep 66 times in the Bible. Now, I want you to notice here uh, in, uh, the, in, in, in these different scriptures, and I'm going to read out to you. What I'm going to do is, is I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to uh, call them out, and we're just looking, we're, we're, we're looking for the key word death and, and sleep is what we're looking for. In Deuteronomy chapter 31 in verse 16, the Bible says, and the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. Sleep with thy fathers. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, in verse 12, And when the days be fulfilled, and thou, David, shalt sleep with thy fathers. This is, this is what they said when, when, when David and, the, and, the, and the, the other leaders would, would die. And often you say, they slept with the fathers. 1 Kings chapter 1 and verse 21. Otherwise it shall come to pass when, when my Lord the King shall sleep with his, with, with his fathers. Another in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 10. So David slept with his fathers and he was buried in the city of David. 1 Kings 14, 20. In the days when Jer Jer Jeroboam reigned were two and twenty years and he slept with his fathers. Do you see this over and over how they refer to death? Job chapter 3 and verse 13. For now should I have lain still and been quiet, I should have slept, then had I had been at rest. Very, very clear to hear Job 7, 21. Uh, For now shall I sleep in the dust, and thou shalt seek me in the morning, but I shall not be found. All right. Now, that's all Old Testament. Let's take a look at some New Testament. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 24 here, that talking about this, this, the maid is not dead. This is Jesus talking here about the maid, maid is not dead, but what? She sleepeth. She, she sleepeth here. And then we read this a little earlier, John chapter 11, verse 11. These things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps. <clears throat> and then uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 6, But some are fallen asleep. I Means some are already, already dead. So even in the New Testament, you see this over and over. 2 Peter 3, 4, For since the fathers fell asleep. See, over and over in the Bible, Death is referred to as sleep. First Thessalonians 4.13 But I would not have you to be ignorant even. Brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those that are, that are dead, that you saw are not even as others which have no hope. So very clearly, friends, we see uh, that, in the, that, that sleep is a biblical term for death in the Bible. And you think about it, sleep is, is really a beautiful illustration of what happens uh, when when someone dies, they 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 just like going to bed at night, and and you and you're you're tired, and you wake up the next morning, you know, all refreshed. Or you know, I don't know if any of you had a surgery where you were put under anesthesia, and and I mean, you you get the anesthesia, and you know, time is just nothing, and then boom, you wake up, and wow, it's over with. And uh, if this is this is what it takes. It really takes the fear out of death. Uh, for Christians, they lie down, they sleep, but with that quiet assurance that Jesus will waken them in the morning of the resurrection and his second coming. Now, notice also that this teaching right here lines up with the second coming study that we've already done. And you're going you're gonna to notice that, see, night after night, remember we're building that fence row, and, 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 and each verse 
that, that we have looked up since night number one has got to always line up. They got to line up from, from the very first night all the way to the very end. Every single verse, we looked at 20, 50 scriptures every night. Every one of them has got to line up. They cannot contradict each other. And you're going to see how that will fit tomorrow night in our study that we're doing also. And so let's, uh, uh, let's look at this here, talking about the second coming of Jesus, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 31. What a glorious day this is going to be. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of the trumpet, right? And, and, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds of one end of heaven all the way to the other. What a glorious day, friend, that is going to be here. All right. So now... Let's, let's go on now and let's look at and see what the Bible says about our dead loved ones. What, what about, what's the Bible say about our dead loved ones? Let's go, uh, let's look at Ecclesiastes again, chapter 9 in verse 5. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know what? Not anything. Neither have they any more reward. In other words, they're not up in heaven looking down on you. They're not in in hell looking up at you, they don't know anything. They're just asleep, according to the word, word of God here. For the memory of them is forgotten, and also their love, and their hatred, and their envy is now perished. Even love. Think about it. You know, they, uh, if they were up in heaven, they're going to be loving their loved ones, or, 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 or loving God, but they don't. They're, they're, they're asleep. They're just plain asleep. The dead know not anything, no love, hate, etc. Nothing. Now, this is important right here because the devil and his angels really try to, to mess people up here. What about those who actively communicate with various loved ones who have died? You know, that's pretty popular. Uh, there, if, if this is really our deceased loved ones and, 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 and truly the dead have come back, then, then we can't trust the Bible, friends. I mean, we've not looked at one scripture. We've looked at 20 or 30 scriptures, and every one of them all agree that when, when you die, you don't know anything, you're asleep in the grave. Very clearly it, uh, there. And so, um, listen, make no mistake about it, friends. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, uh, not of this earth here. You know, the devil can work miracles too. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 14. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather, gather them to the battle of that great city of God Almighty. Here's another one. Second Thessalonians 2 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Okay. Friends, the devil loves to take advantage of grieving hearts. And he knows that people would do anything, anything to, to, to see their loved ones. And so he is able to impersonate them. He is, we know that, we know that, the, that Satan and his angels were kicked out where? To this earth. Kicked out to the earth. So beware to those living on this earth is what the Bible says. Yes, there is demonic forces out there. They are real. They are defeated. But they are really out there. And that's the reason we've got to stay close to Jesus, friends, because we are no match for them. And, and they love to continue that lie, that, that lie. Oh, surely you shall not die. They love to continue that lie, his evil angels. See, all spiritualism and this new age witchcraft is based on this teaching right here. Satan can deceive us unless we know the truth, friends. Make sure everything lines up with the Word of God. Everything. We can't trust ourselves. Listen to what Job, chap, Job says here in Job chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. The eye of him that has seen me shall see me no more. Thine eyes are upon me, and I am not. As the cloud is consumed and, and vanished away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. He shall return no more to his house. Very important there. Uh, neither shall his place be known any more. Very, very clearly here. Job chapter 16, verse 22. When a few years are come, then I shall go the, way, go the way which I shall not return. 
I've heard people personally say that their that their dead loved ones come and visit them in the night in, in a dream. Friends, that does not line up with the word of God. And it's the enemy trying to deceive you is what, what it is. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 in verse 10. God says, There is no work, device, or knowledge in the grave. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where you go. Friends, if you're going to do it, do it now, before you die. Now, to summarize ever, everything, one passage of Scripture makes it so very clear. Job chapter 14 and verse 12. Now, listen to these. We can learn a whole lot from this Scripture right here, a whole lot. Key words. So, uh, so man lies down and rises not. So he lies down. Talking about death here. And death, and he's not going to rise to win. Notice this key word, number one. To the heavens be no more. To the heavens be no more. And, thou, and, and they shall not awake, nor be raised up out of their sleep. Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that thou wouldest keep me secret until when? When is the dead going to be raised? Until thy wrath be passed. So it's going to be after the wrath of God, after the wrath be passed, that thou wouldest appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time, I will wait. Wait to when? Until my change comes. Okay. We got some very key key points here we're going to look at. A man is in the grave until when? Until the heavens be no more. You're going to stay in the grave till the heavens be no more. Till the wrath be passed. Until my change comes. Now I want to look at each one of these. One of uh, till the heavens be no more is found in 2 Peter 3:10. Till the wrath be passed. We're going to look at Revelation 15:1. Until the, my change is in 1 Corinthians 15 in verse 51. Okay, let's see what the Bible has to say about each one of these points right here. First, we're going to look at when the heavens be no more, found in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away. There it is right there. To the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works therein shall be burned up. So very clearly here that we're looking at the at the very end of time here. Now, now let's look at the second one. Uh, we'll remain in the grave until when? Till when God's wrath be passed. Let's look at Revelation chapter 15 and verse 1 here. Revelation 15 verse 1. And I saw another sign in the heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. There they are right there. For in them is filled up with what? The wrath of God. Okay, clearly, clearly right here we're talking about at the end of time. In other words, this happens at the end of time. All right, now, the third one. When when will the dead be changed? They're going to lay in their bed uh, in, the, in the grave. They're going to lay there at the second coming of Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51 and through 54. Let's read this together here. Behold, I show you a mystery. And that's what we're looking for tonight. The God is solving that mystery. He's solving it for us. Where does he solve it? In the word of God, friends. In the word of God. Uh, we shall not all sleep. Now we know what that means, don't we? In other words, we're not all going to die. But we shall be changed. Here it is, the change. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall shall be raised incorruptible and we wish and, and we shall be changed for this corruption must put on incorruption and this this mortal must put on immortality so when this this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal have put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory so what do we just learn from the bible here it says, we're not, we're not all going to die. There's going to be some of us alive when Jesus comes. I believe he can come any day. Amen. But so the Bible is saying when he comes, the dead in Christ are going to rise, right? And they're going to be given a new body. 
You know, uh, and, and but but those that are alive and remain will be changed. If we're alive when Jesus comes, we're going to be changed. We're going to get be given a immortal body, right? Amen. Amen. Praise God. And uh, you know, I, some of us are getting a little bit older than what we used to be, and and I think we're going to get and we got some aches and pains. We're not going to have to worry about that no more. Amen. Amen. That's something to get excited about, right there. We were just talking about that a little earlier, but notice. All three of these passages that we looked at refer to the second coming of Jesus. It just makes it, it makes sense. If, if, you really, if you really didn't die, see, you're going to lay in the grave until the second coming of Jesus. And, and, it, and that does make sense there because if, if, you, if, if you really didn't die, then, then why, would you, why would we need a resurrection? In other words, why would you need a resurrection if you didn't die, if you were, if you were, if you were uh, up there already floating around? Of course, nobody wants to talk about the ones that are, that are burning. But um, So when we die, we wait to be resurrected. That's what we've learned from Scripture tonight. And while we wait for the resurrection, we just sleep. And, and time will be just like that. You know, the person that dies, he won't or she won't know the difference anyway because it'll be just like that. They go to sleep, boom, they open their eyes. It's just like they did go straight up to Jesus. It's us here on this earth that need to know what really happens so you won't be deceived by the enemy and he won't impersonate your dead loved one and try to deceive you about the Word of God. We must, we need to know the truth and the whole Bible has got to line up, friends. So, now, what a beautiful day that's going to be. And we've already looked at this once before, but the Bible is very clear. When Jesus comes, there's going to be two groups. The lost uh, and, and, and the saved, basically. That's right. That's the two groups. Now, one group is going to be excited because they're going to say, hey, there's my Jesus. And there's other groups, as we read, they're going to be wanting to run and hide and, and hide under the rocks because they knew that that was Jesus knocking at their heart's door, but they had always rejected him, friends. I think that I personally think that we're going to recognize Jesus. And so, uh, but both, both uh, it says right here, there's going to be two groups. There's two groups of people when Jesus comes. The saved and the lost. Both will come up at one of the two resurrections. There, there's two groups of people, uh, and both are in the grave until the end. The, the, when, the, when Jesus comes, you're going to have you're going to have basically four groups. You're going to have those that are that are righteous living, and you're going to have those uh, that are that are that are lost in living that don't know Jesus, and you're going to have those in the grave that are lost and those that knew Jesus. Okay. Now, and both are in, in the grace. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. 4, 13 here. And this is going to explain every bit of this to make it clear. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we, we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that they which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord should not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, so loud it's going to wake the dead, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead, what's going to happen to the dead in Christ? Those that, those that put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ, what's going to happen to them that's already died? Okay, they're going to rise first. They're going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, that's the ones that are going to be alive when Jesus gets here, uh, shall be caught up together with them, the ones that were in the grave, right? They're going, to get to, they're going to get to rise up first, and they're going to ascend up to heaven to where Jesus is at in the clouds, and then we're going to be, we which are alive and remain, shall be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And the Bible says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. What a glorious day that that's going to be, friends. Beautiful day. The dead shall... Now, this is a key point here. Notice what the Bible says here. The dead shall do what? Rise. Rise. Key word. Uh, rise. If they were already in heaven, they wouldn't be able to rise, Right? They'd have to come down. Does that make sense? They can't rise. All right? When, and when will they rise? 
When will the dead rise? When Jesus comes. At the second coming of Jesus Christ. And they all go together. The ones, the dead in Christ, and we which are alive remain, will all go up together to meet the Lord, who will always be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. A great big family reunion. Amen. All those that put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ. What a day that's going to be. No more pain, no more suffering, no sickness, no tears, no death. What a, hanging out with Jesus. Praise God. What a wonderful day that's going to be. This, this is a promise from Jesus right here. This is a blessed hope. John chapter 14 and verse 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and listen to these key words here, and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Now, so when Jesus comes, uh, the, the, when Jesus comes, he says, I will come again. And what's he going to do? He's going to receive us to himself. If we were already with him in heaven, there wouldn't be, he wouldn't come to receive us, right? He's coming down to get us. You know, he's working on a place for us right now. He's coming back to get us so that we can be with him where he's at. That's what the scripture is saying right here. Very, very clearly. Amen. All right, the Bible says when Jesus comes, the lost are going to be slain. Now, we, we've talked about this earlier. When, in the second coming, when Jesus comes, the brightness of his coming, there's going to be one group that's wanting to hide behind the rocks, right? They don't have that asbestos suit on of Jesus, the robe of Jesus' righteousness, because they never, they never gave their life to Jesus. And, and the bright, they're going to be consumed by the brightness of Jesus coming. That's what's going to happen to those that are that, that are lost when, when Jesus comes here. And they're going to be slain by the brightness of His coming. 2 Thessalonians 2 8 says, And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume, notice that word, consume, with the spirit of His mouth, and they shall destroy it with what? The brightness of with the coming. brightness of His coming. And the, and the Bible says that they would not live again to after the 1,000 years, which is a study we're going to be looking at here in, in, a, in a couple of nights. Revelation 20 verse 5 said, But the rest of the dead live not again until the 1,000 years were finished. And that's going to be one whole night that we're going to dig into this. You probably heard of the millennium, the 1,000 years. So an incredibly good sight and Bible study. And we're going to do that together. I hope you can you can join us now. Now, what I want to do in the remaining time that we've got here is I want to look at some Bible passages that might raise some questions. Now, remember, what are we doing? We're building a fence row, right? Since night number one. And so far, that fence line is straight. Every scripture, every scripture that we have looked at lines up with the other scriptures that we looked at. Okay? Now, there seems to be some scriptures that might not line up. And so let's, I want to take a look at them. Now, one of them that uh, you might be thinking right now is, didn't Jesus tell the thief today you will be with me in paradise? That's a good question. Let's look at Luke chapter 23 and verse 42 and 43. And Jesus, and, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into the kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Wow, that seems to throw a monkey wrench in all these other like 50 scriptures we looked at, right? So, what's going on here? What's going on? From reading this, Luke 23, 43, from reading this, it appears that Jesus did promise the thief that he would go to paradise that day. However, if that's true, we're faced with some problems here. First off, uh, and so let's, we're going to look this over. Now, first thing I want to point out is the thief did not ask to go that day. He didn't ask. Look it over. Look at that scripture over. He, asked, he, he had his theology straight here. He asked to be remembered when Jesus comes into the kingdom. All right. Now, and, and remember, remember this. Jesus, we've already looked at this. Jesus didn't go that day. 
right? We've already proven that from Scripture tonight. Uh, three days after, he told Mary not to touch him, for he had not ascended to the Father. John 20, 17. So we know that. So what is the answer? It's very simple, friends. The simple answer is in this Greek translated text here. The Greek does not have punctuation as we know it. When, when, it, was, when it was translated from Greek into the, to our modern language that we have here, the scholars that did this, when they did that translation into English, what they did is they put a comma in the wrong place. And you're thinking, oh, no, that's not possible. That's the Word of God. Now, the original Word of God was in Greek, friends. This was just a translation that is made years and years later, okay? And when it was translated into English, okay, they put the comma before the Word today. Now, you change it, and I'm going to just show you here. Now, notice how it reads here. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, look what happens when we add the comma after today. And Jesus said unto him, Assuredly, I say to you today, comma, you will be in paradise. In other words, Jesus said, yeah, I'm telling you right now, you're going to be in paradise. He's not telling him when. He's just telling him today it's going to happen. See, it was all in, in the common here. So, changes the whole meaning. And so, um, now, very, very clearly, uh, it, this is right. Now, before you get all alarmed, <laughs> and, and I imagine you could. Uh, there's another place in the Bible, and you might find some humor in that, where the punctuation is put in the wrong place. In Acts chapter 19 and verse 12 here. Let's read this together. So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons. Now what's sick here? The handkerchiefs or aprons, right? Is that possible? No. So let's just change the, the comma here. Instead of being after aprons, Let's change the comma here to be after sick, and let's see what it says. So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs and aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Very clearly. Friends, it's just a punctuation, and then everything lines up. All right. Now, here's another biggie right here. I, I hear this all the time at funerals. Uh, doesn't Paul preach... Uh, to be to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I mean, how many of you heard that? Lots of us have. Very, very common. You know, we've all heard the saying, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's how they word it. You know, and but what does it really say in the Bible? Let's let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8, and let's read this from the Word of God. We are confident. We are confident. Paul is saying here, we are confident, I say, and willing rather. That means I would rather be. Willing rather. That's a big difference than, than what we read a while ago. Paul said, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. That's a future tense. That is future tense, is what that is. I would rather be, is what he's saying. Now, the question here, uh, the, the, the question here is, is when would this take place? Paul, Paul would rather be absent. What he said here, I'd rather be absent, absent from this body and present with the Lord. So when we all, when we all, yes, we'd all love to be, all right? You know, this is a good example right here of taking a scripture out of context. Now, I want you to notice something very, very important here. This is the second, uh, the second, this, this is the, this is second Corinthians, or the second letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. In, in his first letter, and we've already read this earlier, his first letter that he wrote to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul had already told them when he would be absent from the body and with the Lord. And let's read this together. Behold, I show you a mystery. Now remember, the Bible does not contradict. Paul's not going to say one thing on his first letter and then totally contradict himself in the second letter, right? Because that wouldn't line up with the Bible. He would appear wish-washing. 
Satan loves to make God and his prophets appear wish-washy, but God does not change. The Spirit of God impressed him to write this. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the light's trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible. And we, which, and, and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. So, when this, this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Amen. Amen. Praise God. One more. Also in his closest testimony here. Wrap it up. Um, Paul once again affirmed. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. You know, Paul's getting ready. Getting ready to go to sleep. He fought that good battle. Uh, he says, uh, For I am now ready to be offered. Ready to be offered. Uh, and my time of departure is at hand. Is death. For I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. What day is he talking about? What day? The second coming. And not to me only, but unto all them, all them also that what does what? That love is appearing. Very clearly talking about the second coming of Jesus. At that day. Friends, he's talking about the second coming. Are you ready for that day, friends? Are you ready for Jesus to come? Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. This has been an incredible Bible study. Tomorrow night, the night tomorrow night is going to be a wonderful Bible study. Jesus says, do you trust me? Some of you are hearing this very, for the very first time, friends. Jesus says, do you trust me? Friends, do you trust Jesus? Do you trust his word? Do you believe uh, the word from God? Or do you want to believe the lie from Satan? Friends, we can't trust ourselves. We can't trust our own understanding. In these last days, we've got to trust the word of God, even above our own understanding. We've just got to do that. Tomorrow night's message is Revelations to Lake of Fire. We're going to look at Hellfire. We're going to look at that. And you're going to see how the second coming and, and what happens to you when you die and Hellfire and then in, even in the millennium, they all fit together perfectly. Thank you so much for joining us on this Bible study. God bless you. Jesus loves you, friends. And he is coming back soon. Uh, let me have a quick prayer. Father in heaven, thank you. We just pray that you pour out your spirit. Thank you for the for the assurance, Lord, uh, that, that, uh, that, that, that you have got the power to resurrect the dead. And also, Lord, thank you for the peace that, that we know that, that, uh, that, that our, our loved ones are just asleep right now, resting, waiting on you. No pain, no suffering, not looking down on here on all the terrible things going on on earth. We, we thank you for that peace and comfort in that, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. And see you tomorrow night.